Okay, so let's continue then. Well, first of all, thank you for the nice and, uh, introduction. Uh, I think you told more already about the legal context than I will do in the, my talk. I have one slide on the EU data directive, but no more. I was really triggered by your uh, um, talk because I had to think, okay, one of the nice examples I immediately thought of was uh, your Wi Fi writer. Is that public information? Yes or no? Because, well, Google is. Uh, they're basically saying, well, you have to opt out of it with yourself, right, by just saying, uh, don't scan me, basically. So, okay, well, um, so I'm going to try and make a case that we can do uh, uh, design for privacy. And, um, well, I will talk about uh, some of the issues uh, you talked about as well. Um, so, well, thank you uh, for inviting me here, of course. It's always nice to uh, give a talk. So let me uh, um, start by telling you what I'm going to do, so I'm going to give a story that well, hopefully makes you think a bit, ideally teaches you something, and it's also sort of amusing, hopefully. So this is my background, um, this is basically a collection, uh, a word cloud of all the papers that I have uh, published in the last uh, 10 years or so. Uh, most of it is in uh, computer science, so if you look at management, which is quite large there, it is uh, autonomic management or self-management of distributed systems. So, uh, but I've done, uh, my PhD was on, uh, uh, basically on uh, securing smart card uh, applications. So I have a background in uh, privacy and I'm interested in uh, privacy and security uh, things for quite some time now. Well, so privacy, we all know more or less what it is, right? It's uh, um, it's uh, uh, something that uh, everybody here at least should know. And it's, um, well, it's a problem, which is also something that uh, everybody should know by this time. So a very brief recap. What are for me key aspects of privacy? Things like freedom from intrusion, so being left alone. Um, control about your information, uh, uh, about oneself, but also things like freedom from surveillance, right? Being tracked or followed or watched or whatever. So to make this a bit more concrete, I have an example. And I have uh, immediately a question for the audience because I want to ask you, what is this? Snelwegen with cameras, so, so I hear uh, uh, highway lines uh, with uh, cameras. Somebody already guessed it, it's indeed uh, the tracking data from my iPhone. So as a next question, then where do I live? Friesland. <laughs> yes, very good. Yeah, you see, the sort of, if you look, it's a star topology, right? If you trade in the middle and then from there I'll travel uh, well, everywhere basically. So my parents live in uh, Maastricht, and uh, friends of my girlfriend live in uh, Twente, and so on, right? Um, okay, so this happened uh, last summer, and uh, when this happened, uh, the first reaction was a lot of confusion, right? So this is from uh, the 20th of April, and uh, the, the, the uh, immediate reaction was, uh, okay, well, Apple, what are you doing? Uh, you're tracking uh, people, why are you doing that? And um, so a day later or so, uh, Apple faces questions from Congress about uh, iPhone uh, tracking. And it, uh, of course, in the United States, uh, two days later, Apple is sued for privacy invasion and computer fraud over location tracking. So this was sort of the first reaction, a lot of confusion, and then a bit more clarity. Um, basically, uh, two days later, again, Apple says, well, no, 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 this was all a misunderstanding. We didn't really do something. And then there was an uh, official uh, press uh, blog where they basically said, uh, why is Apple tracking the location of my iPhone? And then the answer is, Apple is not tracking the location of your iPhone. So wait a minute, what happened then? Because we had, you could generate these nice maps, right? So there's something wrong there. Um, by the way, as a nice afterthought, uh, um, Sometime later, in June, uh, the, uh, there was a uh, location tracking uh, privacy bill uh, introduced, basically saying that you're not allowed to do this. OK, 
Okay, so my question was, okay, what, is, what, what really happened here? So it was a sloppy design of a time stamped cache with location of cell towers stored unencrypted and ASCII on your uh, mobile phone but also on the uh, backup on your uh, computer. Um, and the cache is then mistaken for a timestamp user's location <coughs> information. And then after release of a tool, six months after this was already known, the media picks it up and then all hell breaks loose. So I think ultimately you can say this is a design error which led to an unintentional privacy break or leak or uh, whatever. So could this have been prevented? Well, I think it could have been prevented if the engineer who had first built it had realized that he was tracking uh, that this was privacy sensitive information. Or if quality control uh, had uh, realized this or somebody else had uh, paid attention. Because I think um, my main thesis is that we know how to build uh, privacy preserving uh, software systems. So, uh, well, I mean, we have a l we sort of know how to do this kind of thing from all these military applications, but of course, it, I mean, about 40 years in computer security research, but also uh, from uh, uh, law, uh, from, from legal uh, um, legislation, uh, like the EU Data Protection Directive that you just uh, did. We have a lot of experience with building secure systems, and by extension, also we're building privacy preservation preserving systems, I think. There's an example, well, we already showed it, the, 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 the EU Data Protection Directive. But uh, basically five principles, um, transparency, purpose, personality, access, and transfer. So I have again a question for the audience. Anything special you notice about these principles? Well, you can probably notice a lot, but I'm looking for something specific, of course. Transfer on? Sorry? Transfer? Well, transfer is something that is definitely uh, one of the uh, things that you may not really stress, but it's definitely an issue because a lot of these uh, privacy, uh, a lot of these data processes <coughs> basically at a certain point they have a nice uh, big uh, collection and then they sell it to somebody else or give somebody else access, right? There's nothing about opt-in or opt-out. There's nothing about odd enough out, but that has actually, uh, it, that's not what I mean here. Um, but you're right. It's uh, sort of in the, the uh, um, let me see. Um, retention? Yeah, maybe. Okay, so what I was looking for was actually that these principles are technologically neutral. So they're written in such a way that uh, uh, it does not deal with machines. Which is quite nice. Um, because for, for privacy, you, you need a, a link. With, the only thing you really need is a link with individual humans, right? You don't need to use any technology to uh, basically uh, do a privacy uh, uh, violation or breaking of uh, other people. Technology, the machines make it a lot easier. Um, so, as an example of how you can build a uh, privacy preserving system, um, if you can make sure that your data is anonymized, if you don't store the uh, information uh, with the person, then uh, your uh, if you don't know from whom the data is collected, the privacy is ensured. I think, but you're free to question that or challenge that. Of course, it does not work if you anonymize after the collection, because what typically happens is if people try to do that. You either um, anonymize uh, the data in such a way that the data comes completely useless. That's uh, what happens if you do the anonymization in a good way. Or you don't anonymize uh, well enough, and then you can still uh, extract uh, from your data collection uh, who a uh, different person was. OK, so another example. Um, well, if you talk about uh, privacy, you have to mention Facebook. I think it's sort of mandatory nowadays. Um, so Facebook has been very concerned about uh, this uh, uh, cyber bullying, and um, so they basically say that uh, anonymity online has to go because uh, cyber bullying is uh, uh, 
the serious issue. And of course, this is a serious issue, but if Facebook is telling you that cyberbullying is uh, very serious and therefore anonymity has to go, you might uh, want to reconsider uh, this. But very nice is also if you read the actual article that uh, the other person uh, saying this is uh, former CEO of Google, Eric Schmidt. So you have sort of the two uh, largest uh, data collectors in the world here together saying that anonymity on the web has to go. Sorry? Wij van WC heet. <laughs> yes, exactly. Um, so, okay, but back to my uh, uh, original uh, thesis that uh, we sort of know how to do design for privacy. By, by using, for example, the principles of the EU Data Directive or by using these privacy enhancing technologies that uh, a lot of people mm -hmm. working in that field. Or technical solutions such as anonymity preserving system, for example. Something else to note here is that privacy is not an add-on feature. As in security, right? you can't really add it later. So I think if you want to build a privacy preserving system, you have to build it uh, from, you have to take privacy into account from the beginning. You can't just build a normal system and then later on add a nice uh, privacy layer. It just doesn't work do it. Sorry? It, it might be very hard, but it's, it's very well possible. Yeah. I think it will be very difficult to do that, and I think it's uh, depending on how complex the system is, I think it will be impossible. Okay. But maybe you're right, it's only very hard. There might be brilliant people who actually know how to do this, but I don't in any case. I'm not sure about this because it's it's the same with security. Yes. Normally you should have security built in, in your design from scratch. Exactly. Security is not but an uh, add-on feature. But a lot of systems get it as an add-on feature anyways. Yes, that's true. But a lot of systems are also not secure. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so um, my claim is that building these privacy-preserving systems is actually not a real issue. <coughs> um, so if you look, for example, at anonymity, there are quite nice technical and other solutions for obtaining anonymity. And by extension, privacy uh, online, right? You have Tor, uh, the, the Onion Writer, uh, uh, these, these anonymous peer-to-peer uh, uh, -peer client file sharing uh, tools like uh, Freenet, uh, anonymizer on emailers, which have become sort of extinct in the age of spam, but they did exist for a while. Also, things like uh, open Wi-Fi uh, networks or university library or internet uh, cafe. <coughs> I mean, this doesn't always work, of course. But this is from 2005 already. This is in Italy, where if you want to use a computer, you have to show your passport first. In an internet cafe, anyway. Uh, but in, in general, I think there are quite reasonable uh, means to uh, get anonymity online if you uh, want to. So, if we have pretty good technical solutions, why is privacy then still a problem? So I think privacy is a trade-off. And I think that uh, the incentives of a lot of the stakeholders, the users, but also a lot of other people in the system, are completely wrong, usually. The system is sort of rigged to be against privacy, I think, in a lot of different cases. Let's give an example. This is the example of the dancing pig. Anybody heard of this? So this is an experiment from Ed Felton, a uh, professor at uh, Princeton. This is from like uh, the, the uh, mid-90s or so. You see the nice and ugly Netscape uh, browser. So they, they, they did an experiment with students um, and later on repeated with larger books. So the idea was, uh, uh, do you want to see the dancing pigs? And this was a Java uh, script uh, thing and then um, they had uh, um, made the browser in such a way that if you uh, wanted to see the dancing pigs, you got a pop-up that asked you, um, are you really sure that you want to see the dancing pigs because um, clicking uh, continue might, uh, uh, it has a high risk because of the files might be uh, uh, modified on your computer. So what happens? Well, given a choice between dancing pigs and security, users will pick dancing pigs every time. So this is like 90 plus Okay, so explicit warning, but this is what happens. And this is of course also true for privacy. So if we look at the average user, then, well this is more a security uh, example, but So 
I really like the, the ID banker uh, sort of si signature by the, the uh, Fisher in this case. But I mean, this is a serious problem, right? There are a lot of users who still think that these things are legit. It's so bad now that uh, the, the major banks in the Netherlands have started, finally started the campaign on TV saying that, uh, listen, if you get a mail from us asking for your password, we have not sent it to you. Banks don't send mails to you asking for your password. This is like, I think, three or four years after it was already a serious problem. Okay, so another uh, example. There are, of course, also people that don't want privacy. So this was uh, a case in Mexico where um, a rich guy basically had a tracking chip uh, implanted uh, in his arm. So that's uh, because he was afraid that he uh, might be abducted, which is uh, high risk in uh, Mexico, apparently. So, uh, uh, it doesn't help against abduction. Well, no, this is actually, if you read the, the, the <laughs> article, you see that it doesn't really help because, um, let me quote, um, media accounts reported that an armed gang invaded Fernandez's home, sliced open his arm with a pair of scissors, and extracted a satellite enabled tracking device. So, indeed, it doesn't really help, it only sort of makes the situation worse, I think. But, of course, this is also the user incentive, right? If you don't want privacy, then. Uh, you're not going to get it, basically. So, well, Facebook bashing is always popular if you talk about privacy. So, one other example, which is longer the United States Constitution or Facebook's privacy policy. <laughs> so, this is already from some time ago, but indeed, Facebook's privacy policy is longer. And, uh, and we, moreover, they keep on changing it every other day or so. This Constitution doesn't change that often. So, um, this is a nice example illustrating this. So this is sort of a tutorial on uh, how to put Facebook uh, on a privacy lockdown. And note that this is slide one of 33. <laughs> <laughs> and um, moreover, it doesn't, I mean, so some uh, PhD students from um, Ross Anderson's group in uh, Cambridge, they did some research uh, to this. What they actually did was they wrote an uh, automatic application, a Facebook application that you could download and you could just uh, push a button uh, so that uh, it would go immediately to privacy lockdown mode. But the problem was Facebook kept on changing the <laughs> rules and the privacy statements and the policies and so on. So eventually they gave up because there was just no... Uh, basically Facebook didn't want it to make easy to lock down your <laughs> privacy uh, policy. <coughs> okay, so there are a lot of these laws, right, that try to regulate uh, privacy of users. Uh, you already talked about some of them. Uh, there's a long uh, uh, history, and uh, in the United States you have also all these uh, sector-specific uh, um, laws. So we have a lot of different ones. They all try to do more or less the same thing, but some are more fierce than others. So a nice uh, example here is uh, cloud computing. So you have data accessed in the EU. For example, you use Google Docs. This data is then stored in, uh, on a, a server in uh, the US. So then the question is which privacy laws uh, apply? Any idea? I'd hope both. I thought uh, because of this agreement they have, this kind of something with bridge in the world, they agreed to have the European laws. Uh, yeah, that's the safe harbor agreement. Yeah. Indeed, so uh, that's in case. So Google is a safe harbor compliant company which means that you sort of have to comply with the EU data directive, but in a lighter form, it's not really the EU data directive. Until the US government politely asks for the data. Well, <laughs> the, if the comp but that's the same here, right? If the government asks for it, then all bets are off. But uh, we know these two are uh, absolutely for sure, but what Google, of course, also does is all these large cloud computing um, companies do. Sometimes it's a bit busier on their server, and then they just move part of the data to Argentina or to uh, India or to whatever and you basically don't know anymore where your data is located so you don't also don't know anymore which privacy laws uh, uh, are in uh, play. You do know that the, because the data is accessed from here and there's some European involvement that de de definitely holds and that's probably the strongest you can get but there might be other possibly conflicting laws uh, in play. My answer would be that given that you have a user agreement with Google not the European entities of Google, uh, the European rules still apply regardless of where the data is. No, the, the European rules apply, that's for sure, I agree, but you don't know what other uh, uh, rules might also be in play. Yeah. 
and especially what happens if there are conflict conflict between uh, rules, for example. But I think this is still a very much an open issue, something that will become only worse uh, in the uh, next couple of years if cloud computing is uh, really taken up. Okay, so then we, I go back to my question. So we have all these laws and regulations. Why do we even still need technical solutions then, right? Well, of course, because one of the biggest uh, uh, bad guys in this case is the government, right? I mean, uh, you already said that uh, with the Patriot Act, you can get everything uh, uh, with the Patriot Act taken in. This is a nice uh, uh, picture illustrating this. So this is who is censoring the internet from uh, Reporters Without Borders from the beginning of this year. So the internet is not censored in places where you basically don't have internet. And everywhere else it's censored, in, in some variety or another. Um, and then, of course, there are quite bad cases. Well, we know China, right? This example is from uh, uh, three years back now. So this was during, uh, there, were, uh, there was a large earthquake in uh, China, and then some people were a bit, uh, um, they were sort of critical of the Chinese government and how they handled the rescue uh, efforts. And then uh, what happens is there comes a pop-up of these two nice uh, guys, so uh, Ying Ying and Cha Cha. And uh, they basically, the first line says something like, uh, uh, no wrong content. <laughs> and the second line uh, says uh, advance uh, harmony. So this is the Chinese government's way of uh, telling you that uh, don't be too critical uh, on uh, uh, your blog. I think it's rather original. The Iranian government just does this, uh, basically. Actually, it's denied. It happens quite a lot if you ever visit uh, there. Of course, there's also a lot of ways around these, uh, these uh, censorship uh, things. Uh, with a lot of these uh, social media things, right? Uh, the, the Facebook and the Twitters. So Facebook has a very bad reputation, I think, with. Uh, with regards to privacy, but they, with uh, these Arab Springs and uh, Iran, uh, after these re-elections, uh, they helped a lot as well. Um, so one of the, 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 the nice examples is uh, Weibo, which is the Chinese Twitter. So they are uh, very popular now. And um, they basically Weibo has become too big to censor eff effectively. So the, the Chinese censoring system can really only censor uh, uh, at, at the end of the day. And by that time, there's already people uh, protesting or whatever. So my prediction is 2012 will be the year that the Chinese government will ban Weibo, because I, they can't control it anymore. And they sort of have to control it, especially in a year where there's a new uh, change of power in the Chinese uh, structure, power structure. Um, one other thing is, of course, that these same tools that break privacy uh, can also are used to ensure freedom of users, right? But of course, um, they were also used during the summer rides in the UK to, uh, to, to sort of organize uh, people. I mean, I mean uh, they're becoming more and more popular as well. I was talking to some people from the police, and they're now also actively um, looking at uh, Twitter with, uh, uh, for example, big soccer matches uh, to see where uh, people are uh, going to do other things than watching uh, soccer, basically. Okay, so one other thing is uh, uh, video surveillance. So that's uh, something where in the United Kingdom are uh, uh, number one in the world. In. These stats are from 2006, so this is like five years ago. And then they had for every uh, 14 people one camera. So by now, I think they're sort of one on one. So this is, uh, on average, they used uh, a thousand cameras to solve one crime. The question is how effective are these things, right? They're re relatively effective for auditing purposes. So after something has happened, you can look back and then see, okay, what happened exactly. But there's so, because there's so much information, it's almost impossible to process it, and it's, uh, it's not very, um, there's no real life uh, update, uh, basically, of information. Okay, so, um, <coughs> Echelon, everybody has heard of this, I suppose? It's 
But this is by the, the big five, right? Uh, the United States and the UK, and then uh, Canada, I think New Zealand and uh, uh, Australia. So, uh, um, let's say used for, for, well, it has a military application, of course, and for diplomatic communication. But it's also uh, supposedly used for corporate and spinners, for example, amongst others. So, uh, to, to sort of sum up the role of the government, very bad, and there's not a whole lot you can do about it unless uh, maybe uh, use a strong uh, crypto. And there's a lot of uh, uh, nice uh, open uh, source uh, tools for that. If anybody has an idea what the picture on the right is? PGP yes, source, source code? code? Yeah, so this yeah. is indeed uh, uh, the, the, the PGP source code. So back in the 90s when uh, encryption was an ammunition, uh, you were not allowed to uh, um, export from the United States uh, weapons-grade uh, encryption uh, algorithms. So what people did was basically uh, print out uh, the source code in a, in a large uh, format and then uh, shipped over the, the printed uh, source, which is uh, uh, not uh, uh, software, so it doesn't, it doesn't fall under the ammunition uh, trade. And then uh, here people used uh, uh, basically OCR techniques to uh, restore the source code and uh, recompile and uh, everything working. This is how PGP was introduced in uh, uh, Europe. At least this is what they use this to sort of uh, to show also how uh, stupid this encryption uh, rules were. Yeah. They actually uh, designed a special font for it. Yeah. Indeed. So they can see the difference between uh, uh, accolades and um, regular records. Yes. Yeah. But does it mean it's uh, <laughs> so well of, of course uh, the, the United States eventually gave up right encryption. Uh, it was just too difficult basically to keep uh, everything uh, in house. You know, other place people were also it was actually bad for companies at a certain point because all these uh, American companies that were also doing business in uh, Europe, they had to use these lower grade uh, encryption, which was pretty bad and uh, relatively easily broken. But um, also, uh, I like this uh, quote by Gene uh, Stratford a lot. So using encryption on the internet is the equivalent of arranging an armored car to deliver credit card information from somebody living in a cardboard box to someone living on a park bench. I always tell my students that using your credit card information on the internet is uh, the, the sort of, you don't have to worry about these uh, locks on there and uh, just use your credit card and don't worry about the rest. Because what are credit card companies? Credit card companies, they have the perfect business model. The only thing they, they sort of uh, uh, handle in is trust, right? So they have money from the bank, uh, the, the vendor, and the people using the credit card. So from all different parties, basically, to uh, allow to use their infrastructure. So what happens if you use your credit card on the internet? Somebody steals your credit card information. Then you go to your credit card company and you say, somebody stole my credit card information. Can I please get my money back? And then maybe you have to say twice, but then you get your money back. Because the, the one thing that credit card companies really don't want is that people don't use credit cards uh, on the internet anymore. <coughs> okay, so one more thing. Yeah, this was actually before he died. Um, the, the slide, I mean. So um, we have all these technical solutions, laws and regulations. So then another problem is, of course, uh, enforcement. Who does that? How do you do that? So I think enforcement is done by the government, which is of course one of the main offenders, so that's a pretty bad uh, incentive right there. Um, well, you have auditing, uh, uh, of course, by uh, usually by the private uh, sector. Uh, so there the question is also, how well does it work if you let your banks uh, being audited uh, by uh, the same big uh, auditing companies? Well, we sort of have the answer to that question at this moment. Not really good. And then, of course, uh, uh, there's uh, still a nice uh, open source uh, uh, things out there. Um, so one of the problems of enforcement is, I think, that it's based on trust and transparency. So let's start with transparency. It's very difficult to ensure uh, transparency, right? It's, I mean, how open is or less whichever system? Even if it is completely transparent, 
Linux is completely open, right? It's a completely open uh, uh, tool, but for the typical, uh, typically it's way too technical for the average user. And to be fair, uh, and nobody's really going to check all the source code first before they uh, are uh, running uh, their things. So uh, electronic voting is of course a nice example where even if you can make it uh, completely, if you use completely open solutions, the, the system will never really be transparent. Uh, I think because you can't really explain it to the average user of the voted, uh, voting system. Trust is even worse, so we don't know who to trust, why and when. This is very context dependent, of course. I think transparency can help, but it's also uh, well, these open source uh, tools as well. Okay, so my takeaway message. Um, I think good technical and legal solutions exist for privacy. But privacy is really a trade-off between what you want to use uh, what you want to give away and especially privacy is also a problem of incentives from different stakeholders and of course it's never uh, if you have a good uh, technical solution there will always be a domain for it I think but uh, yeah so my uh, thesis is we can build it we just don't know really how to use them and we don't really want to use them okay that was it. Thank you. So there were not a lot of questions during the talk, so I hope that you now uh, <coughs> have some questions for me or not. Yeah, what kind of censorship uh, is there on the internet in the Netherlands? That's a very... Uh, <laughs> Oh, I have to repeat? Yes. <laughs> on the map, uh, we could see there was censorship on the, the internet in the Netherlands. Yeah, let me show you. Yeah, basically but everywhere, right? But, um, yeah, but what kind of censorship is there on the internet? Because Fred Teve didn't get his uh, filter yet. No, that's true. Uh, and this, this map, right? Yeah. So, well, if you want to know more, uh, look at uh, the, the open net. Uh, I don't know exactly what they uh, I mean, I haven't really uh, looked at that in uh, detail. Okay. So. <coughs> I once uh, heard a talk by Eben Morgan about uh, the Freedom Box. Do you know anything about that and whether it's... Uh, Sorry, the... The Freedom Box by Eben uh, Morgan. Yes, oh, sorry, I'm not familiar with it. Okay. okay, well, if we're done, then... Uh uh, well, thank you very much. Okay, well, um, you're welcome. Can I ask you a question? Sure. I was kind of hoping for um, design principles to minimize the processing okay. of data yes. and, and cryptography and stuff like that. To what extent is that involved in your research? So I am doing research on this kind of thing, but um, uh, I mean I can also talk about it. But uh, in this talk, I wanted to keep it a bit more high level because I don't really know what kind of audience. So I would well, it's, it's a hackerspace. They're supposed to know about crypto. Well, I don't know. <laughs> I wasn't uh, really sure because you also were not sure who was coming. Yes, that's true. But um, uh, no, yeah, I don't have a. Uh, um, I mean, I think in general privacy is a very hard technical problem as well, of course. That's why it's nice to do research. Uh, and I don't have a, ni a nice uh, uh, saying that, well, you should do A, B, and C, and then everything is fine, of course. But there are some uh, general uh, uh, guidelines. And then uh, uh, you can look uh, very technical and, you know, use uh, encrypted file systems for all your... Uh, uh, where you, if you store data, then do everything on like, the file systems and using uh, the multi layer to access control uh, and so on. But well, would you be out before I follow up with that? Uh, oh, sure, I'm always out uh, for a follow up. Uh, okay, thank you Lise, very much for being here. I also would like to thank GMC for doing the both well, the video and the audio stuff <laughs> and your kind of. Uh, underappreciating that in the department, so thank you so much.
And, uh, well, thank you all for being here. Thank you.